Tonelli. Oh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Davide De Pietri Tonelli, a PI here at the Italian Institute of Technology in Genova. Uh, today is my great pleasure to welcome everyone uh, to uh, today's RNA collaborative seminar uh, hosted by Italian Institute of Technology and uh, RNA Initiative, which is part of the, uh, this, uh, this institute uh, uh, work. So uh, today is my great pleasure uh, to introduce you the two speakers uh, who are uh, Roberto Gianbruno and Caterina Gasperini, two words about uh, their career. So Roberto graduated in molecular biology at Sapienza University in Rome, and then he obtained his PhD at SAM Institute in Vienna with uh, Superative uh, Furga as a PI. He is currently affiliated uh, postdoc in Nicasio Lab at uh, Italian Institute of Technology Center for Genomic Science in Milan and a researcher at CNR also in Milan. And um, after Roberto, we will have a talk uh, from Caterina Gasperini, who graduated in molecular biology by Via University in Italy and got a PhD uh, in neuroscience in my group in uh, IIT Genova. And now he's currently postdoc uh, in Harvard University in Boston in Lee Rubin Lab. Uh, Lee Rubin Lab. Uh, okay, with that, I leave the stage to uh, Roberto and uh, who will talk about uh, RNA mining proteins uh, uh, dealing with uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA. So Roberto. Yes. So I'll start sharing my screen and okay. Now you're supposed to see the presentation and okay, perfect. So thanks Davide for the introduction and good afternoon to everyone. And today we uh, will present you the work that we did in the last years about the SARS-CoV-2 RNA biology. But before entering into the project, I just would like to introduce you the main players that act on this project. Indeed, this was a joint effort between three groups at the IET, and in particular the group of Francesco Nicasio, the group of Giancatano Tartaglia, and in particular the work done by Elsa and Andrea, and the group from Tommaso Leonardi with a special thank to Camilla and Logan. So I will start just with this slide as just a general introduction on SARS-CoV-2. I will not go much in detail about it. I just would like to pinpoint some aspects. First of all, the fact that SARS-CoV-2 is a positive single-stranded RNA virus of a 30 KB long genome. And once it is infecting the cells, actually the virus releases its genome and it requires the interaction with all the host proteins in order to perform all the uh, cycles, um, all, all, the step, all the steps in its life cycle. In particular, it requires the host protein for the translation, but also the replication and transcription. Therefore, understanding which are the RNA host protein interactions that occur in cells is crucial because we can then at that point try to impact on these interactions, therefore inhibiting the viral replication. Several groups had did this uh, already in, in the last years, and in particular, four of them have published an RNA-centric approach. Through that, they, they use um, the, the, the infected cells with SARS-CoV-2 RNA, and then they pull down the, uh, the genome, and then identify by mass spectrometry all the proteins that have been attached to the SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And here on the right, I just display a cartoon derived from one of these studies where you can observe that this, there is actually a plethora of RNA binding proteins that are involved in different cellular biological processes that can interact at multiple stages with the uh, viral RNA. However, when you look at the data sets and you combine them, you can observe that there is a very low overlap among the different studies. And in particular, there are only 11 proteins that have been reproducibly identified in all of them. The source of this low um, reproducibility is definitely derived from different aspects, and I listed some of them here, in particular the fact that in the studies that have been used different cross-linking agents, but also the fact that they use different uh, cell lines that have different SARS-CoV-2 susceptibility. And on top of that, uh, the studies were also performed at different time points. In particular, we have experiments performed at eight hours after the infection and others at 48 hours after infection. And of course, you have to keep in mind that during this time that the virus is replicating into the cells, you have a huge amount of viral proteins and RNAs that start to accumulate into the cell, therefore also interfering with the host RNA protein interactions. And, and another aspect that has to be noted is that um, the initial antiviral response, so those proteins that initially they're trying to recognize the uh, exogenous RNA that start to mount the antiviral response, are of course penalizing this type of studies. 
And finally, we are missing information about which is the portion of the RNA that is bound by the different host proteins. We decided to actually um, address the identification of RNA protein interaction um, of SARS-CoV-2 RNA with the host proteins using a different technology, in particular the, pro the, the technology developed in the um, Paul Cavaris group that is called RAPID, that stands for RNA Protein Interaction Detection coupled to mass spectrometry. And this approach is very powerful, first of all, because it can be performed in living cells, it does not require any cross-linking step, and it can be performed on a very small amount of cells, therefore reducing the cost. And uh, this essay is based, is based on a proximity ligation technology, thanks to the use of um, bacterial biotinating enzyme. And in particular, in the rapid, you use the activity of this basu that, as you can observe in this plot, has a very strong activity compared to the other biotinating ligase uh, proteins that have been purified from bacteria. And in particular, the activity of basu is within just 30 minutes. But how the system works? So you basically take your cells and you overexpress a cDNA that codes for the RNA of your interest. And this RNA is flanked at both ends with a box B stem loop. And then you could express in cells also plasmid coding for the basu that is fused to a, lam a lambda N peptide. In this way, you are able to exploit the um, lambda N box B system in the way to, uh, to bring the basu in close proximity to the RNA of your interest. And then at this point, sorry, at this point, you just provide into the medium the biotin. And once the biotin is presented to the medium, the activity of the basal starts to be active and therefore biotinylating any lysine that goes in close proximity to it. And by close proximity, we are talking about a less than 10 nanometer ranges. Once all, the, all these proteins have been labeled with biotin, you can stop the reaction, harvest the cells, extract the proteins, and then perform the streptavidine pull down under the natural conditions to enrich specifically for the proteins that have been biotinylated and identify them by mass spectrometry analysis. Of course, as I said, the, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA is 30 kb long, so it was not really feasible to apply this system for the entire genome. Therefore, we decided to uh, focus on specific regions and we took advantage of a study performed by the Tartaglias group, where they noticed that actually the first two KB and the last two KB of the virus were the most structured regions and also the ones that were more prone to interact with the host protein. And this is also something that is according with the biology because these are the regions containing the different regulatory elements such as the UTRs. Therefore, we decided to design 10 overlapping fragments of 500 base per each, covering both the first 1.5 kb and the last 1.5 kb of the SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And on top of that, we designed a scramble control to use as a negative control of the same length and the similar GC content compared to the RNA fragments of the virus. And on top of that, we carried with us also a positive control that is the ADEM15 RNA of which we know the interactor. So the first thing we did was to check whether in, we had the possibility to predict a correct folding of the fragment that we designed according to the data that are available in the literature. Because now um, there have been released the shape data about how the SARS-CoV-2 RNA folds in living cells. And this is just an example of fragment one, where you can appreciate the fact that actually all the seven stem loops that have been described by the shape data for fragment one, uh, sorry, for the five prime UTR were also retained within the, the fragment one. So altogether, this data confirm that how we design the RNA is predicting to allow them to correctly fold into the cells. Therefore, the interactions that we are going to retrieve are most likely going to happen also in vivo. So then we performed uh, the, the assay. So we express the RNA together with the basu and we provide biotin into the system. And we confirmed that everything was going correctly through Western blot analysis, in particular using a streptavidine HRP conjugate that marks every protein that has been biotinylated. And you can clearly see that in the absence of basu or in the absence of biotin, there is basically no signal for biotinylated proteins. On the other hand, when you express both biotin and basu together with the different RNA fragments, you have several proteins that starts to be biotinylated. And these are the ones that you would like then to retrieve from the whole cell lysate. And you do this by performing a standard streptavidine pull down, as I said before, under the natural conditions. So you're sure that you're just retrieving the proteins that have been biotinylated. And the system worked correctly, as you can observe here, because on the flow through, there is basically a depletion of all the biotinylated proteins that are instead all collected in the different eluates. And these eluates are the ones that are then subjected to mass spectrometry analysis. 
In total, we perform uh, the, this experiment as a three independent biological replicates, also performed in three different parts of the years. The proteins have been digested with trypsin and the peptides analyzed by QXactive plasma spectrometer. To analyze the data, we use the MaxQuant software, and in particular, we use the label free quantification method, and we obtain an, uh, um, around 1,300 proteins from all the um, interactomic studies. And I have to say that we also imputed any missing values by adding the minimum LFQ detection value. So to confirm that our, our system was working correctly, what we did was to first concentrate on our positive control, so the ADM15 RNA, and we uh, analyzed the data using a Vulcano plot, where you can have on the y-axis the um, student t-test p-value, and on the x-axis you have the fold enrichment of interaction with the ADN15 uh, RNA versus the scramble control. And uh, as you can see in the figure, you have a cloud of gray dots that, that these are actually the proteins that are equally binding both the RNAs. On the other hand, on the upper right part, you observe these three proteins that are highlighted in black. That these are the proteins that are significantly enriched only with the ADN15. And among them, we retrieved that the top interactor was self one, that is the known, the known interactor of ADN15. So confirming that the system is working as expected. So at this point, we applied the same type of analysis also to the other RNA fragments. And uh, this is just a picture showing the Vulcano plots that have been performed for the analysis of the 10 different uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA fragments. And I just would like to uh, bring your attention to the fact that for all of them, we were able to retrieve specific interactors um, among, the, uh, among the, 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 the proteins that are interacting too. And then we put all the data together in this representation, thanks to the Cytoscape uh, software, where uh, you can uh, appreciate the fact that actually the fragments, they are interacting with some proteins at multiple levels. In particular, there are some proteins that are shared by multiple fragments, but there are also proteins that are exclusively bound by single specific fragments. At the same time, you also find proteins such as this wing tree that is present at the border region between these two neighboring fragments, most likely binding the overlapping regions of these two fragments. And in general, what we can also say is that the vast majority of them were RNA binding proteins that are the ones that are highlighted with this grand circle. And this is something expected in line with what we, we thought, because of course we are just um, recovering the proteins that are binding to the RNA. We then perform a gene set enrichment analysis to try to understand uh, what were the terms that we are, were reaching for. And we were um, glad to observe that we are reaching for terms such as viral transcriptions, but also in general terms regarding the metabolism of the RNA, such as nonsense mediated decay, translation, but also the splicing and the transport of the RNA. Therefore, these proteins are interacting with the RNA and have some impact on it. But the, the other thing that we did was to overlap our data with what has been already published. And this is present here in this venue, where we retrieved that actually the overlap of our data with the published data set is not so high. We indeed retrieved just 10 proteins, but this was still a very good result for us because you have to consider that we analyzed just 3 KB out of the 30 KB genome that has been uh, performed by the other studies. And on top of that, we are not working with the entire virus, but just with pieces of it. So the fact that we can retrieve the same proteins that have been retrieved from infected cells confirm the fact that actually our system works as well. And uh, we also um, overlap our data set with the ones that derived from the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, knockout functional studies that have been performed in the, um, on SARS-CoV-2 RNA that have been reviewed in Bagan and Tal in 2021. And actually, you can see that 23 of our interactors have been identified as a factors that have a proviral or an antiviral function towards SARS-CoV-2 RNA. So together, this data says that uh, the, the interactors that we retrieve are not there by chance. So there is really a biological meaning why they're interacting with the viral RNA. But of course, we had a list of 73 interactors. You need to identify a way to fish out the right ones, so the ones we would like to follow and continue to study. And uh, um, thanks to the um, software that, was, that is well established in the group of uh, Jangetano Tartaglias, Tartaglia, what we did was to um, exploit the system called CatRapid, that is a predictor of RNA protein interactions, to estimate which were the interactions that, are that were most likely to occur in our data set. In particular, CatRapid estimates 
is the binding affinity between an RNA and a protein based on their interaction propensity, but also on structural items such as the presence of a known nucleic acid binding domain or disorder region in the protein, or a specific RNA motifs present in the RNA that can favor the interaction with the proteins. So the first uh, step was to actually check whether the prediction of catrapid were in line with what we retrieved from our experimental data. So uh, we use um, RNA binding protein dataset present already in the RAPID software that was composed of over 2000 entries. And then we analyzed this, um, we analyzed whether the prediction of catrapid were in line with our experimental dataset. And what we observed is that actually we had a predictive power of the catrapid that was of more than 80% in agreement with our um, experimental validation data, especially considering the top interactors. And this uh, predictive power increases even up to 95% when you were analyzing the single fragments. So altogether, this says that we can ad adopt the catrapid score as a way to discriminate which were the most inter interesting RNA protein interactions. And this is what we did here in this plot. So we ranked all the protein interactions according to their Catrapi score, starting from the, the, the interactions with the lowest Catrapi score on the left and the one with the highest Catrapi score on the right. And uh, as you can appreciate here in this box plot, actually we discovered that the fragments were differently distributed. So the, we, uh, we had some of them that were equally distributed among all the different, uh, among the, the curve. But there were also others, such as fragment one and two, that were showing a very low catrapid score. Others, such as fragment 10, that were enriching, enriched in the portion where of high, high catrapid score, probably confirming the fact that these are the regions, especially in terms of the RNA structure, that are favoring the, the interactions with proteins. So we decided to filter um, the, the data by applying the 85th percentile of the distribution. So this corresponds to this corner here on the upper right part. And in, in the same way in which we did for the experimental data set, we remove all those interactions that have been also enriched with a scramble control. So in total, we obtained 373 RNA host protein interactions that were predicted by CatRapid. And among them, uh, we um, were glad to observe that nine proteins were also in agreement with our experimental validation. And in particular, among them, we um, identified RPS6, FAM128, and LSG1 that are known RNA binding proteins of the SARS-CoV-2 RNA. We have also other proteins such as SMGS7 or SF3A1 that have been um, computationally predicted by the group of, um, of, of Marsico. And um, among all of them, actually, our interest was mainly triggered by the presence of this protein here called PUS7. Why PUS7? Mainly because this was um, the only RNA modifying enzyme that we uh, identified. And in particular, this protein is, it belongs to the human pseudouridine synthase family. This family in mammal cells is composed of 13 members that are depicted here. Among them, PUS1, TRAB1, and PUS7 are the most well characterized. And of them, uh, it is known the consensus sequence. And in particular, for PUS7, I just highlighted the fact that we have this sequence called UNWAR, and we also have the more restricted consensus sequence called UGWAR. And, but what is this modification um, in, it consists of? So actually, uh, this is an isomerization of the uridine, and in particular, the carbon in position um, 5 isomerized with the nitrogen in position 1, and this switch actually bring the nitrogen group to be exposed into the solvent. And in this way, uh, this is actually altering both the structure of the RNA, but also can affect the interactions between protein and RNA. And this type of, modi mod of modification have been extensively studied in the past for non-coding RNA, and in particular with work performed on the, the tRNA and the ribosomal RNA. But very recently, this modification have been extensively studied also messenger RNA, and in particular, there was a last uh, paper published on cell uh, that, where they uh, um, discovered that actually pseudouridine is regulating the splicing. But about SARS-CoV-2 RNA, why this is important? It's mainly because um, the group of RANA um, described that um, they, they perform a mass spectrometry analysis to identify all the possible RNA modification present on SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And among them, they discovered that pseudouridine was the most abundant one. 
Unfortunately, by mass spectrometry, you cannot really say which is the position is modified. You cannot map, map it on genome. So you can just say whether it is present or not, uh, this modified RNA. Therefore, we decided to try to address this question and to try to map where these modified sites were present. And we did this by performing nanopore sequencing analysis. Of course, in the lab, we didn't have the possibility to perform SARS-CoV-2 infection by our, ourselves. So we teamed up with the virology unit at the San Rafael Scientific Institute here in Milan. So they performed um, SARS-CoV-2 infection on three different cell lines. And then they gave us the, the cell pellet. We performed the RNA extraction and then performed the nanopore direct RNA sequencing. And here, I'm just using uh, this animation derived from the Oxford Nanopore Technologies to uh, simply bring um, to describing you how this third generation sequencing work. So actually the great advantage of nanopore direct RNA sequencing is that you can analyze and sequence the RNA when it is present in its native uh, conformation. And in particular, the RNA present in your sample is catched by this motor protein that uh, force the RNA to pass through the nanopore one nucleotide per time. And once it's passing through the nanopore, there is actually here a sensor, it is the one that here highlighted in red, that is detecting the ionic current. Whenever the nucleotide is passing, the nucleotide is modifying the ionic current in a specific way according to the structure of the nucleotide. Therefore, you can, according to the modification of the ionic current, understand which is the base that is passing there and, uh, and sequence your RNA of, in of interest. And as you can imagine, this system works not only for the normal nucleotides, but also for the nucleotides carrying a post-transcriptional modification. And here on the left, I just show you an example uh, about how you can distinguish the ionic current difference between a guanidine that is methylated compared to one that is not methylated. So there is a, a very def defined difference in the ionic current signal. And thanks to the, an algorithm called NanoCompore developed by Andrew Leger and Tommaso Leonardi, you can actually systematically and robustly identify all the modifications that are present in, your, in the RNA in your sample. And this, you do it by comparing the signal to, uh, versus um, a control reference, such as an in vitro transcribed RNA that is an RNA devoid of any modification so that you can use as a, as a control. And this is exactly what we did. So um, we perform, we first of all concentrate our analysis at the transcript level, mainly because uh, the subgenomic RNAs are the most abundant form of RNA present in the um, infected cells. And we uh, focus the, our analysis on the 14 canonical subgenomic regions produced in cells by SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And we use as a reference the in vitro transcribed RNA that was provided um, and public, made public available by the group of Nari Kim. And uh, we then analyzed through nanocompore the, pre the presence of modified uridines. Whenever there was a significant uridine found in a specific position in our nanocompore data, then you were, uh, we were marking this with this uh, black line. And we performed this, um, this essay, uh, so the, sorry, this analysis um, on CACO2, CALO3, and Vero E6 cells. And you can appreciate the fact that actually the image looks quite similar in all, all, all of the cell lines. However, we still have a lot of events. So to really concentrate on the most confident ones, um, we decided to apply some filtering conditions and in particular to say that to be a high confident site that we can say this is modified uh, by pseudouridine, it has to be identified in at least two out of three cell lines. And on top of that, it has to be contained within the PUS7 consensus sequence, the one that I said, UNOR. And here, just displaying this representation, um, the 53 sites that pass our threshold and how they are displaying the subgenomic RNAs that are encoding for the canonical orbs. And among them, uh, we in particular highlighted the ones in which you observe the sequence that is written, uh, because there are eight sites of them uh, that um, carry the most restrictive consensus sequence of PUS7, this one called UGUAR. Um, and these are definitely the ones that are uh, for sure target of PUS7. And among them, we were quite um, in intrigued by the fact that we discover a modification present on the TRSL of some of these subgenomic RNAs. And most likely, the presence of pseudouridine in this site can impact on the translation of the subgenomic, uh, uh, subgenomic RNA. However, we still don't know if this is a positive or a negative event. We are still working on it. And uh, with this, 
I would uh, just like to conclude and to summarize what I've shown you today. So um, we have characterized uh, the host protein interactions by applying a different system. So this is called uh, rapid MS. And in particular, we focus on the five prime and three prime ends of the SARS-CoV-2 RNA and we identify several factors that are most likely going to impinge on the SARS-CoV-2 RNA life cycle. And among them, our attention was caught by uh, PU7 because this is a writer enzyme and, um, and, and the, in line with the fact that we retrieved PU7 in our interactomic analysis, we discovered that several use were modified from our nanopore direct RNA sequencing analysis. Now we have some open questions that we are currently working on. And unfortunately, I don't have data to, show, to share with you at, at this stage, but we are trying to understand exactly which is the biological role of pseudouridine on the SARS-CoV-2 RNA biology. And on top of that, whether PU7 is the only enzyme acting on it or there are other enzymes. Because for instance, in one of the interactomic studies performed by Flynn et al, another pseudouridine synthase, PU1, has been discovered. So we think this is not the only enzyme that can act on, on SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And with this, I would like to acknowledge the people that contributed to this work, and in particular, the people from the Nicasius group, and in particular, a special thank uh, to Francesco Nicasio, the people from the Leonardis group, and in particular, Camilla and Logan that took care of the, uh, the nanocompore analysis. And the group of Giangatano de Tartaglia, and in particular Elsa and Andrea, that took care of the analysis of the cut rapid uh, predictions that I showed you. And also Elena Criscolo from the Sarafaele Scientific Institute to perform the uh, viral infection. And Tiziana Bonaldi, the IEO, to give me the, the access to the mass spectrometry unit to perform the mass spectrometry um, uh, experiments. And the people from the UK accelerate to help us with analysis of nanopore sequencing. And with this, I've stopped and um, I'm happy to receive any question. Thanks for the attention. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Thanks. Yes. Thank you, Roberto. Very nice talk. Let's leave uh, the stage for question uh, in case there are any. Uh, otherwise, I, uh, I don't see question in the Q&A. Uh, otherwise, I can start with one question related to the redundancy of post enzyme. Uh, with respect to, to pseudoridylation, do you expect that it, it, this is um, the most important one, for example, expressed in hairy cells? Or so, can you elaborate on that? We honestly don't know if so. In terms of, of expression, definitely uh, PUS7 and the other PUS enzymes are expressed at the same extent. However, what um, can be quite different is the activity of these enzymes. And uh, at the moment, we don't have an essay that can tell us exactly if an enzyme is more active than another one. Uh, from the, some data that we have, uh, in some preliminary data that we have in the lab, we think that there might be some redundancy among the, the different PUS enzymes, and especially PUS7 and PUS1 might have common targets. However, it is too preliminary to say whether um, in the case of SARS-CoV-2 RNA, PUS7 is the only enzyme acting on it or whether the other proteins, in particular, for instance, PUS7 has also a paralog called PUS7L that can also contribute in, uh, with, the, with its activity on the pseudo-redirection of the RNA. Okay. And related to the array cells, can you eventually, did you have a look, for example, at the expression of PUS7 in these cells? Yeah, the, so the expression of PUS7 is quite constant in every cell line. Um, there, there are no uh, cell, or at least the cell lines that, that can be infected by SARS-CoV-2 RNA do express PUS7. So we are not expecting something different when you are changing the cell line model or um, in a specific cell line such as lung versus another uh, type of um, like an epithelial, uh, epithelial cell. Okay. So then uh, might be a good target for, uh, seems a good target for therapy, no? Maybe for yes, therapy. definitely. Also because actually in, no in, in November 2021, uh, there was an, um, a small compound that actually has been described to uh, partially inhibit the catalytic activity of PUS7, just that this small molecule is still not um, available in the market. So as soon as, uh, as can be available, we definitely are going to use it and check Yes. Uh, whether this can impact or not on SARS-CoV-2 replication. Okay, okay. Good luck. Meanwhile, it looks like a Q&A today doesn't collaborate. So okay. <laughs> if anyone wants to ask questions, uh, Fabrice just said to 
to ask them through ah echo we have a question in the chat from uh, gang chen uh, they ask whether um, about he asked whether about chemical modification in the frame shifting of pseudo knot in the region I, maybe i'm not completely understand the, the question he ask whether there are uh, chemical modification i believe possible uh, in the frame shifting of pseudo knot region anyway in general from our nanopore uh, nanocompore data uh, we can, we just focus on the presence of modified uridines so we just know whether these were present or not as a modified uridine compared to the IBT transcribed rna uh, we didn't check for other chemical modifications most likely they are going to to happen but i don't know i don't know the results honestly okay so unless there are other questions maybe not we are already 31 i would then thank again roberto for your nice talk and i would leave the stage to caterina for a next talk on pyrene in neural stem cells so yeah stage is yours wait let us share the presentation can you see it okay so thank you davide for the kind introduction and for having me inviting me to give it this talk i'm very happy to uh, be here today and to have the possibility to talk about the work that have been carried out in the lab of Davide, uh, which is the neurobiology of Mirna lab. The focus of the lab is the study of the molecular control on neuron stem cell fate, and in particular, we have been working on the, uh, the study of microRNAs and PU interacting RNAs. And today, uh, I'm talking to you about the PyRNA pathway, and in particular, uh, how Mili. Uh, sustains neurogenesis and prevents cellular senescence in the postnatal hippocampus. So I will give you an introduction on how pyrnas and the PIRNA pathway is produced and has been studied about also adult neurogenesis and the regulation of adult neurogenesis, and then we will move to the results. So in the first part, we will dissect the pyrna pathway expression during adult neurogenesis, and in the second part, we will infer the function of the pyrna pathway in adult neurogenesis. So, what are the, yeah, the, the pyrnase? Pyrnase are PU interacting RNAs consisting of 26 to 32 nucleotide single strand RNAs. They are dicer independent and they are organized in the genome in clusters. They are very abundant. We know like 10 million of unique sequences in mouse and they are poorly conserved among the organism. And they can have a post-transcriptional and a transcription regulatory capacity, and they are mostly expressed in gonads. They have been discovered in drosophila, but they are also expressed in mammals. In gonads, what we know, and this is true also in somatic tissues, uh, the pyrnas are transcribed in uh, the nucleus from pyrna clusters or transposon loss. Size. They are transcribed in long pyrene precursor export into the cytoplasm where they are where they interact with the PeeWee proteins. And in the adult mouse, we have Mili and Miwi, two main PeeWee um, proteins. And so they interact with these proteins to perform mRNA target repression. So the target repression is achieved through the canonical RNA interference and also to the disc so-called ping pong loop, which is a self-amplification loop in which the pyrna target becomes itself a pyrnase once it is cleaved. So the target, the main target of pyrnase in the germline are the transposable elements. Transposable elements are uh, mobile genetic elements that can move in the genome and integrate in different region of the genome. So the pyrnase are considered to be the vanguard of genome defense because they protect the genome integrity from the invasion by these genomic parasites. And so they are critical for germline cell cell maintenance. So what about the brain? Because we know that the, these transposable elements are also expressed in the brain, in adult brain, and in particular during neurogenesis. So what is known about the pyrene pathway in the mammalian central nervous system is that they are, it is expressed and even if the level is very low compared to the germline, 
but the function of Pierne pathway is that's to be proposed to control, to be the control of synaptic plasticity and memory. And moreover, Pierneys have been reported to be altered uh, also in several diseases, neurological diseases such as autism and Alzheimer's disease, suggesting a possible role of this pathway in also in uh, uh, neurological function. And as I told you, the level is very low of this Pierne pathway, but however, in somatic tissues, the highest Pierne expression is observed in the hippocampus, followed by cortex, liver, and kidney. And this is very interesting because the hippocampus is one of the two niches of the neural stem cells, where these neural stem cells are during all the life, so during all the lifelong. In the hippocampus, we find the so-called adult neurogenesis, which is the production of newborn neurons. And thanks to the neural stem cells, which are cells mainly in a quiescence form that can exit from quiescence and proliferate, generating these neural progenitor cells, MPC. And today I'm going to talk to you about these cells, MPCs, and they can differentiate and generate mature neurons or astrocytes. And the balance between proliferation, quiescence, and differentiation preserve lifelong and adult neurogenesis. This balance is impaired, for example, during inflammation and aging, where the neural stem cells are most mainly in quiescence, and they most likely, if they dif differentiate, they most likely generate reactive astrocytes, inducing inflammation and, of course, um, yeah, inflammation phenotype in the brain. So one, aging is one of the factors that modulates uh, adult neurogenesis together with a lot of other factors, including epigenetic regulators such as microRNAs. What about pyrenees? Given the fact that pyrenees are so important in the germline for the stem cell maintenance, is it possible that uh, even in the brain, in neural stem cells, they perform the same function. So we wondered, we asked whether the pioneer pathway is expressed in neural stem cells and so in adult neurogenesis, at what stage, and is it involved in stemness maintenance? Our hypothesis is that Yes, it is, and the pioneer pathway could be enriched in hippocampal neural stem cells to preserve their stemness by silencing transposons. To, result, to test our hypothesis, we start with analysis of the PeeWee proteins. So as I told you, Mealy and MeWe are the main two PeeWee proteins expressed in adult mice. So we started the analysis comparing the testes where we know that the, these proteins are very highly abundant with the total hippocampus and the MPCs. And we found that MeWe was almost undetectable in all these um, hippocampus and MPCs. Instead, Mealy, surprisingly, was like almost undetectable in the hippocampus. And this was already been reported. So this was not surprising. But the fact that was like striking was that the level in MPC was not negligible, was like 40% of the level in the testes. And this was like pushing us further in our analysis. And so we looked more closely in the population of the hippocampus and in the cell population and we compared neurons, so mature neurons in culture, with MPC. And we found that the mealy was enriched in the MPC compared to the neurons, again, suggesting a preferential expression of mealy in neural stem cells rather than in mature neurons. And then we followed the cells, neural, stem, neural MPC cells from the proliferation to differentiation into immature neurons. So along 0, 4, 7, and 14 days of differentiation. And we found that the expression of milli protein was reduced during neurogenesis with a peak of expression immediately upon differentiation at DIF4. We then validated this in vivo. So we moved in vivo and we checked for the expression of milli protein in neural stem cell in adult hippocampus. To validate this, we use a split Krebs-Rylar approach to selectively label neural stem cells and their progeny in the hippocampus of a postnatal TD tomato cre reported mice. So we were able to see the expression of mealy here in white, colocalized with the TD tomato red neural stem cells in the subgranular zone of the adult hippocampus. And this was also true at the level of the mRNA when we sorted the cells, the TD tomato positive cells after 10 days and 30 days after the injection of the split cre, meaning the analysis of the immature newborn neurons and the mature newborn neurons. And we found that again, mealy was expressed and enriched in the mature newborn neurons compared to the progeny 
to the, its progeny and to the other population of the cell of the hippocampus. So we were very happy with these results, but what about the other elements and factors of the pioneer pathway? So we checked, of, of course, for other elements that has been proposed to be expressed also in brain, because of course, as I told you, this has been studied all, almost exclusively in the gonads. So a lot of these genes and proteins are expressed just in gonads. So maybe there are other factors in the brain that we cannot know. But we checked uh, the expression of some crucial elements uh, for the Pierne biogenesis, such as the Tudor domains and the MOF daily case MOF10, and they are all expressed in the neurogenesis, so suggesting that in, in neurostem cells, suggesting that the pathway is present, the machinery is there, so what about the pioneers? We perform a small RNA sequencing data on adult NPCs, and we found about 500,000 reads that perfectly aligned to the annotated pioneers. To confirm the identity of these pioneers, we looked at the feature of the pioneers. One feature is, this, is the length. So as I told you, they have to be in the range between 26, 32 nucleotides. And our reads were picking around 30 nucleotides. So they are in the same range of the pioneers. And also another feature is the uridine bias at the five prime ends that they show uh, when they are being processed in the cytoplasm, they are cut to present the, the uridine bias as the five prime end, and our reads harbors this bias. So another feature is the production. So there is a, this pyrene phasing is another way to produce pyrenees, and it's very peculiar. So you can, um, so the, the cleavage of the pyrenees is phased along the clusters. And indeed the nucleotide pair distance probability between the five prime termini of putative pyrenee and secondary pyrenee was distributed similarly to the one of uh, observed in other animals. So suggesting again, that these reads that we found were bona fide pyrenee. Another feature that is very important for the pyrenees is the 2O prime uh, methylation at the three prime end. And we, we were able to demonstrate that some of the most abundant pyrenees that we identified in our system uh, express harbors that methylation. So all this validation has been done to prove and to try to demonstrate that the, the reads that we identified are pyrenees. We check also for the mele dependency. So the, are these small reads Mealy dependent? And the answer is yes, because when we knock down mealy in neural stem cells, we found that the, some of the most abundant pioneers were depleted upon mealy knockdown, suggesting that they are mealy dependent. Interestingly, these reads were distributed in the genome in clusters, and this is another feature of pioneers. So they are distributed and organized in clusters in the genome, and they, we found specifically 298 pioneer clusters that were moving dynamically during neurogenesis with a peak of expression at D4, and this peak of expression we observed also for the expression of mealy. So this was consistent with the, uh, the expression of the peewee protein mealy. And uh, we then um, demonstrated the expression, validate the expression of this, um, some of the most abundant pioneers in uh, vivo, in neural stem cell, in TD tomato positive cells sorted from adult hippocampus. And we found that these reads were enriched in, neuro in neural stem cells compared to the other projects. Uh, to the other cell population of the hippocampus, sorry. So suggesting, everything is suggesting that expression of pyrenees is uh, enriching neural stem cells and parallels the milia abundance. So what about the function? To infer the function of pyrna of pioneer pathway in, neural, uh, in vivo, in neurogenesis, we inhibited mealy using uh, two um, antisensor nucleotides, and we injected this gapmer against mealy in one hemisphere of the brain, in one hippocampus, and the control one in the same um, brain in the other hippocampus. So we, we can have the same, the internal control in the same samples. And then we, after 30 days, we were very happy to see that we, um, did we perform a knockdown of milia, both at the level of uh, um, RNA and protein. This is uh, in vivo from uh, the hippocampal tissues. And after 30 days, we monitor the neurogenesis. So um, we checked for markets of astrocytes and neurons. And here we have an example. So GFAP is a market of astrocytes. And what we found is that after 30 days, there was a marked increase of GFAP expression, both at the level of 
fluorescence intensity, but also at the mRNA level to assess whether this GFAP and this new, these astrocytes are newborn or just a increased expression of the protein, we label the newborn cells with the BRDU immediately after the injection of the GAPMER. And that allows us to label the neural stem cells and their progeny after 30 days. So in here, we saw that if this GFAP, um, GFAP increase was due to newborn uh, astrocytes, double positive for GFAP, GFAP and BRDU at the expenses of neurogenesis. So the production of newborn neurons that was decreased as uh, you, um, revealed by the num decreased number of new N positive and the MBRDU positive cells, suggesting that the inhibition of mili impairs adult neurogenesis and increases astrogliogenesis. And given that aberrant proliferation of astrocytes could bring to the generation of reactive astrocytes, we check the morphology of, of these GFAP cells, and we saw that in the ipsilateral hemisphere injected with the milli knockdown gap mare, we saw an enlarged um, uh, body um, nuclei of these uh, cells and also um, an aberrant morphology of the GFAP cells, suggesting that they can be reactive astrocytes. And confirming this hypothesis, we observed a significant increase in the level of known reactive glial markers upon milli knockdown in adult hippocampus. So confirming and suggesting that the inhibition of milli impairs neurogenesis and increases astrogliogenesis and reactive astrocytes. And if you remember at the beginning during the introduction, I told you that the, during aging and neuroinflammation, there is this conversion of neural stem cells into reactive glia at the expenses of uh, neurogenesis. So <clears throat> Whether Mili is involved in this mechanism is unknown. So to address these questions, we investigated the senescence-associated phenotype gene expressions and also cell cycle exit and beta gadoctodisase disease activity, which is a measure of senescence. So all these are hallmarks of an aged hippocampal niche. And indeed, we found an overexpression and an enrichment of many um, genes related to uh, SASP and also inflammation. We observed a premature cell cycle exit in neural stem cell cultured upon milli knockdown and also an increase in senescence uh, as revealed by the beta-gal activity, both in vitro and both in vivo, which is consistent with the previously observed phenotype in vivo of the loss of stemness is impaired of stemness and induced on inflammation. And also this result was corroborated and consistent with the altered mRNA expression of markers of differentiation, inflammation, and also reactive oxygen and circadian mechanism that they were all impaired upon milli knockdown. Altogether, these data point toward the possible involvement of the pioneer pathway in the modulation of inflammation and senescence in adult hippocampus, impairing neurogenesis and the stemness of neural stem cells. So to infer, to try to infer the mechanism by which pioneer pathway modulates senescence, we look at the target of pioneers upon milli knockdown and upon, no, sorry, upon um, differentiation. So, Surprisingly, we found that in proliferating cells, the non-coding RNA targets, the majority of them were ribosomal RNA and tRNAs and not the transposable elements as we expected from the germline. Instead, the RNA and tRNA were the highest one, at, at least in proliferating cells. But this was not true for differentiating cells. When we put the cells in differentiation, we found that the percentage of targeted transposable elements, such as the line and the sign, was increased at the expenses of tRNA and rRNA. And this is not surprisingly, given the fact that we know that transposable elements are more active in differentiating neurons and not in neural stem cells. So to ascertain whether these non-coding RNAs are modulated upon milli depletion, we quantify their expression in milli knockdown and um, in the neural stem cells and the early differentiation. And we found that milli depletion significantly elevated the levels of 5-srRNA or sine B1 during both in progenitor cells and differentiation, but actually the line one family 
was initially refractory to the inhibition of mili. So this, there is no difference between the control and the mili knockdown. Instead, there was a um, significant increase of line one expression upon mili knockdown in differentiation. And again, this is consistent with the previous observation that line one are more active and more expressed during um, differentiation of newborn neurons. And also these results suggest us that maybe in proliferating condition, the pioneers can have a different function uh, and different targets rather in brain rather than in testes and in gonads. What about the mRNA? Because these are non-coding RNA targets, but of course we look also at the mRNA targets. And we found that the majority of modulated genes upon mili depletion were upregulated and the majority of them were targets or were harboring homology uh, sequences of pyrnas. And the gene ontology analysis of uh, uh, the targets, the upregulated targets reveal pathway genes involved in pathway, uh, such as regulation of transcription, uh, DNA repair, RNA splicing, and translation, which are all functions that have been uh, shown to be regulated by pyrna pathway in germline and somatic tissues. And also, uh, gene ontology of down-regulated targets instead highlights um, genes involved in, in process like apoptosis and uh, uh, cell differentiation, which is in line and consistent with the phenotype that we observed upon mili knockdown in neurogenesis, which is again, the loss of stemness and impaired neurogenesis. And with that, I would like to conclude. So what I've shown you so far is that this is the first report of a role of the pyrna pathway in neurogenesis and mili and pyrnase are enriched in MPCs and are dynamically expressed along neurogenesis with a transient peak of expression during uh, upon early onset of differentiation. And the inhibition of mili and the depletion of mili dependent pyrnase in person neurogenesis induces senescence and neuroinflammation, modulates more than 6,000 genes involved in inflammation, differentiation, circadian, metabolism, and so on. And also that the main targets in neural stem cells of the brain are different between uh, from the ones in gonads. So all these. The take home message is that the pyrna pathway is required for the maintenance of stem cells uh, pools, both in gonads and in brain, but the mechanisms are different. Of course, this is like the first report and the first study and further studies are needed to try to understand which is the possible mechanism by pyrnase and mili modulates neurogenesis and modulates the senescence and the astrogliogenesis in adult brain. And uh, I would really like to thank uh, Davide and Kirill, which is the, who is the bioinformatic guy uh, in our lab. And he was, did a great job with analysis of uh, uh, the mRNA sequencing data and all the experiments and Silvia Roberta for their extremely helpful uh, help and uh, during the experiments and during my PhD and all the Mirna lab that I'm sure is like uh, listening to me and, uh, Hi to everyone, and thank you for your attention. I'm very happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you, Katerina. We leave the stage to question in case there are, uh, please, I remind, use the chat because Q&A doesn't work. Uh, in case there are no question, okay. So, what, uh, maybe I can ask it thinking. Uh, so what could be, in your opinion, the role of, uh, you know, uh, uh, RNA, RNA targets or tRNA as targets of pyRNA in, in nervous stem cells? Ah, wait. Uh, yeah, go ahead with the question. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the RNA and tRNA and also the gene ontology uh, was showing a like, point toward the possible involvement of pyrnase in regulation of translation. And so uh, we speculate that maybe one of the possible mechanisms by which 
uh, new, uh, pioneer pathway was regulating uh, the uh, switch and the differentiation of neuron stem cells was through modulation of translation and aberrant translation. And so we were also able to demonstrate that upon milli knockdown, there is a higher translation rate uh, in vitro, at least in the cells. So maybe this can be one possible explanation why they are main, the main targets, because they are both involved, of course, in translation. And so maybe translation can be one of the mechanisms or the possible mechanism. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Mm, if maybe I can no, stop. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. If there are no questions, uh, then I ask. I simply thank you and uh, thank you, Roberto, for for nice talk and uh, everyone for uh, being here with us today. So have a nice day. Thank you.